afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your interest in coming. Uh, it'll probably be as special for our speaker as it will be for you because he's talking about his family and some occurrences that are that transpired just a few months ago, actually, six or eight months ago, about a block from here. A cemetery that had been lost and had been discussed for many years uh, the Historical Association had gotten involved in a little bit. The gentleman that actually had purchased the property where I might date myself, if there's any local people here, where the, the that that corner over there used to be the Chevrolet place and Matisse's Clinic. I remember all that. The fellow that purchased that heard about the cemetery. He said, I don't want, I, I need to do what I need to do. He said, but if there's somebody buried there, I don't want to desecrate that site. I'm stealing Victor's no, son. That's fine. But the, uh, the, the collaboration that occurred between various groups culminated in what he's going to present to you today. And I know that's why I said it will be as meaningful to him as it may be to you. Uh, fellow sitting right here, is Victor Burns. He is a descendant of the Stedman family. And I asked him if he would to appear in the attire he has on the day because his family goes back to that date. And one of these individuals buried there goes back prior to the Revolutionary War. But I'll let him tell you that. Victor currently is employed by Central Electric Membership Corporation. If you're fortunate enough to live down toward Moncure, you may be on, in their service. If you're not, you're going to have to deal with those people from Duke Power. That's just the way it goes. He's also the owner of the Carthage Martial Arts Academy. So I'm sure if you have anyone that's interested in participating in that type of thing or learning that art, that he will help you out with that. In addition to being a member of our Chatham County Historical Society, our association, he is a member of the Moore County the North Carolina, and the National Genealogical Societies. He currently serves as the chapter genealogist for the Sand Hills chapter, the Sons of the American Revolution. He's already made a contact today, so I think he's picked him up another member. So if you will now, welcome my friend Victor Burns, and he will speak to you about his family this day. Nick says, I, I'm really excited to be here. I've done this presentation a couple of times already. Uh, the first time was for the Moore County Genealogical Society, and the second time was for our chapter of the Sons of the Revolution. But this time, it, it's, it's like Mr. Brooks says, I, I'm at home. I'm originally from Lee County. I live in Moore County, but most of my ancestors, local ancestors, are from here in Chatham. Uh, the Burns uh, clan kind of came here probably around 1730, something like that. Came up the river with the rest of the Scottish Highlands at the time. So in this, like I said, this is home. I have a lot of a lot of uh, uh, ancestors here. Uh, my father even worked at, at the coal mine on this side of the river, probably one of the last times that it was open before it permanently closed down. That's when he was a, a much younger man before I was born. But uh, I'm gonna share with you and, and what I wanna do, and, this is fine if you got questions along the way, we'll stop and, and talk about them. We'll make this more of a discussion than a presentation if you want to, because as, as Mr. Brooks says, we've got uh, uh, people that are in this association have a lot of knowledge about this particular part of history around here. So you can add to, take away, uh, correct me on some things, I'm fine with that. I'm trying, what I wanna try to do is just kind of share what I've learned through this. And it's been, it's been an exciting journey uh, with the, with the Stedmans and talking about the uh, SAR, uh, that's the reason I'm in the start SAR because of Nathan Alexander Stedman III. I've got a, a, a definition for genealogist. I'm not going to call myself a genealogist. I'm more of a family historian, but uh, we do precision guesswork based on unreliable data. We write about those with questionable knowledge. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. But uh, a fortunate thing about the Stedmans, there is a lot of history out there about them. Uh, they're referenced uh, in the Chatham County uh, historical book that's available here. 
at the library downstairs. Uh, some of the state historical uh, publications are in, and uh, they're just they're everywhere. So the, the information about them was was a lot easier to find. And I'm like most of you that if you studied genealogy at all, this was my starting point with a you know, ancestry or something like that. Uh, I did that years and years ago. And then like most people, you hit blocks and dead ends and things like that, and you kind of lay it aside. You know, you don't you don't look at it for, for years sometimes, but all that stuff's under the bed, collecting dust. And every once in a while you pull it out and look at it or or, or for me, my wife says, get that stuff out from under the bed, you know. <laughs> so, but it's the Bible's still there. And uh, I knew a lot about my genealogical history, but there were uh, blocks. But what got me reignited on, on the genealogy study was my uh, first cousin's husband, Paul, which I just sent a text to and told him that this is online so he can he can watch it. Hopefully, if you're watching, Paul, hey. Uh, so... That's where the search began. Paul contacted me, and he was interested in doing some uh, some work uh, with the uh, uh, DNA. You know, he wanted to trace back our ancestry to Scotland, if possible, uh, through DNA research. Now, we did get a couple of hits, and I found some cousins I didn't know I had, and uh, things like that. But going all the way back to Scotland still can be pretty difficult. But I do know that our family has been here since probably the 1730s. Uh, John Burns Sr. is the one that I can get the most information on. He was born here in Chatham County. And uh, he had a lot of uh, hands-on uh, experience with the Revolutionary War. Uh, his grandson married uh, Nathan Stedman III's daughter. So that's how the Stedmans and the Burnses uh, became united. Uh, but it, was, it happened that uh, this interest that uh, Paul struck up with me uh, to reignite with the uh, uh, genealogy and things of that nature. I was sending him pictures back and forth, and I sent him a picture of uh, Navy Stedman's Burns's grave. And uh, he said, you know, he said, you could get into Sons of the Revolution through Nathan. I thought about that a little bit. I said, that might be a good idea. Because to me, it was, it could be another source because, you know, uh, SAR does and DAR, do, they do have a lot of things that you can get into uh, to help with your studies. Uh, so I said, I'll try that. So I, I contacted the state uh, Sons of the Revolution people, and they said, we've got a brand new chapter over in Moore County. And they got in touch with them, or I got in touch with them. And after a little work, because you got to have all your proofs and your paperwork for the SAR, I was able to become part of their uh, organization, which has been a lot of fun for me for the last three years or so. That's about how long I hold that society at this point. Uh, but one night I was at the house and Paul always either emailed or texted me. You know, he never called, but he, he sent me a little text. He said, give me a call. I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> so, you know, that was an unusual event. So I did. I called him back right away. And uh, he, he told me that he had contacted uh, you, this organization, you know, about locating the cemetery over there and finding more information about it. And they were the ones, like, like Dennis said, that had told him that there was a developer in the area that was interested in moving those graves. This is the thing. Uh, the developer did a lot of legwork ahead of time. He talked to the uh, historical society here. He talked to the state. He talked to the church neighboring over here about where to move the graves to. He did a lot of work ahead of time. He did his due diligence. It was very, very good about doing that. But the thing about a cemetery is the cemetery belongs to the family and he couldn't touch it. So there he was. He was stuck, you know, with, with what he could do with that place over there, that little area that he wanted to finish his, his parking lot pretty much. He couldn't just, but he couldn't go in there and bother that one spot. Uh, and then they told uh, Paul about that. Paul called me. I called him. Next thing you know, we're starting to figure out how to release that piece of property to him so that he could go ahead and proceed with moving the graves from where they were to the church next door, to the Presbyterian church next door. Methodist church, yeah, you, you and, yeah. But anyway, we, we were able to do that. That took a little time too. Uh, so you're talking about probably at least maybe almost a year's work 
just to get to that point, plus the work that uh, was done before that. So everybody was starting to get pretty excited. Here's a, here's a little map of, of, of where that uh, the old cemetery was at. You see the circle in the middle? That's that's where we're at now. We're at the courthouse. And it's, it's just a, uh, below it there uh, on the other side of the car dealership that was over here across the road. I'm sorry, King City. So through finding the grave, uh, we were able to kind of determine uh, who we thought was in that cemetery. Uh, we, we thought that there was uh, probably these people were buried there. Uh, Nathan Alexander Stedman II was the earliest grave in the cemetery. He was buried in 1790. Uh, his wife, Prudence, is buried there. Uh, Nathan Alexander Stedman III uh, was probably the oldest individual buried in that grave. He uh, was buried in 1847. Uh, Anna Frances Clark Stedman was his wife. Uh, she was buried, died just a year before he did, thereabouts. Thomas P. Stedman was uh, Nathan and Anna Francis Clark's uh, son. He was buried there. Uh, Winship Stedman was Nathan's brother. He's there. Uh, Margaret Stedman was his wife. And Robert P. Stedman was their son. And Emily Euphrana Stedman, just three months old, uh, was also there. She was the grandson of Winship Stedman. Sorry, get this thing with the airman. Space bar. Yeah, that's what I was trying to hear. Very good. Okay, so the Stedmans originally came from New London, Connecticut, uh, and they moved here right after the Revolutionary War uh, in 1784. Uh, they migrated here to North Carolina. There was three brothers. It was Nathan III, Winship, and Elisha, and also their parents, Nathan II and Prudence. This is a picture of the house that Winship lived in. It's, it was across the street from the car dealership. So, so the cemetery was just right there and the house was across the street. I think that house was torn down somewhere around in the 70s sometime. Uh, this picture it was, is in the archive with, uh, with you guys, with the historical society. But that at one time, there was a big holly tree, I believe it was, in the front yard. And uh, that tree, that holly tree was thought to be the, the largest holly tree in the state of North Carolina. But it's not there anymore either. Here's another house that I associate with the Stedmans. And this is called Cool Spring Tavern. Cool Spring Tavern is in Fayetteville. It's, it's the oldest standing house still in the town of Fayetteville. Uh, when it was built, it was built by uh, Nathan and Winship. I believe had a hand in constructing this, even though it's not talked about. There was something like a Davidson that, that they talked about historically that built the tavern to start with. Uh, a few years later, Winship, the other brother, this, this wasn't in the cemetery, uh, built, uh, moved into the house as a permanent residence for him. He's buried across the street in the cemetery there in Fayetteville. Uh, but the thing about uh, Cool Spring Tavern is an interesting thing about it is. Uh, It was uh, in 1789 that the second North Carolina Constitutional Convention was held at Cross Creek, which is Fayetteville, Cross Creek, uh, and that's where they stayed, it was in that house. Uh, while they were there, the governor, I believe it was Governor Vance, was uh, the governor at the time, uh, actually died at the tavern. Uh, so it's, it's reputed that uh, he haunts the place. I, I, I don't know. Uh, there, there, there was also, uh, uh, a lady there that she was a, a, a slave and she hung herself in the attic. So they, they say they see the light sometimes going around there. I don't know about that either, but I, I know that they've taken the house and it's used for kind of a halfway house for, for women that are you know between homes. So they're training them how to do things, how to do jobs. So it's, it's not open to the public anymore. But me and one of my cousins went up there one day after the place was closed and they gave us a tour of the house. 
they still had some of the old original furniture in there. In the attic, where I was telling you about that they think it's haunted, there was a padlock on the door going to the attic. And uh, the, the lady that was taking me around, uh, I said, you know, this place is haunted, don't you? She said, I know. She said, there ain't nothing up there for me. <laughs> so so that she was not going to go, go off to the open attic or so against her uh, uh, rules. The uh, uh, North Carolina actually ratified the U.S. Constitution uh, that year. Uh, it was the 12th state to do it, and they would, would not do that until there was a Bill of Rights. So we were the ones that were more argumentative about that stuff. But to get down to Nathan Alexander Stedman III, he's really the driving force for us for trying to find these graves because of his Revolutionary War service. Uh, Nathan, um, in the uh, 1776, he actually joined uh, the Revolutionary Army at 14 years old. He served three months, and it was common back then to have short stints. You didn't, you didn't go in and sign up for a year. You thought it was three months, six months. But he served three months with the Army, and uh, I got out of that and decided to uh, join the uh, privateers. Of course, uh, he came from a seafaring family. His uh, great-grandfather uh, was a sea captain in the 1600s. His father was a merchant uh, captain also. So they were right there on the, on the shore of Connecticut. The thing about Connecticut was during the revolution is uh, the, the British were, they would go in and destroy their ships. They were just giving them a fit. So no, nobody around there were, were happy with what the British were doing. So some of the locals were either taking their own ships or building ships and doing things like that. So they became the privateers that went in and started fighting the British. But uh, Nathan uh, joined up with them. He was uh, involved in a lot of a lot of hard fought battles. Uh, he lost a brother at his side on the deck of the ship and was wounded himself at the same time. Uh, he was uh, served and captured by a British man of war and spent the remainder of the revolution in uh, in Bermuda, uh, in prison. Now, back then, it wasn't a nice place to go see. It was prison island, so it wasn't like it was today. So I'm going on vacation in Bermuda. There was no vacation for them. <clears throat> According to, to Nathan's pension application, and he did apply for pension uh, at an older age, uh, there was two ships left to his memory that he sailed on. He sailed on probably quite a few ships, but he could only remember two. Uh, the Connecticut privateer Bunker Hill under Captain John Smith and the Benjamin Sampson under Captain David Brooks. There were the Brooks involved in that. <laughs> so the Sampson, it was a sloop of war. It was a Connecticut privateer brigantine. Uh, she got her letter of marquee the 5th of April 1781. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty good sized ship, 150 ton uh, ship with 18 six pounder cannons and nine swivel cannons on board. And she had a crew of 100 men. So the Samson history tells us was involved in a battle with a, a ship called the Swallow. It was a bigger ship, 226-ton brig of sloop of war. And after about 45 minutes of, of fighting back and forth, uh, the, the Swallow was cut up in her rigging and the Samson bore away. Uh, history says that the Samson had four men killed and 14 wounded. And uh, they uh, went back to port after that. My theory is because, like I said, there was only two ships that Nathan could remember. So his his uh, obituary says that he lost his brother and wounded himself. I think it was aboard this ship that that happened, that his brother was killed and he was wounded. And when they went back to port, Nathan got off the ship. Because later on, uh, in May of 1782, uh, the Samson was captured, and her crew was sent aboard the prison ship Jersey. Uh, eight of her crew, including Captain Brooks, died there. <laughs> the uh, I don't know if any of so, uh, researched any revolutionary sea battles or anything about the ocean or anything like that during that time, but the prison ship Jersey had a bad reputation. Uh, and if you got on that prison ship, you were you probably dead, yes, sir. It was the worst upwards of 10,000 dead, and they're still coming up through the flood, yep, out, out there. Now, was your relative uh. Had gone to New Jersey and then Bermuda, or no, nope. they captured separate. No, nope. he was not on that ship when it because the whole crew from the ship went went to the Jersey, and Nathan was not among 
So mm -hmm. that's why I said I think he got off the ship after that battle with the Swallow, uh, and then he wasn't on it when they had the battle with Jersey. But if I was going to remember any two ships, uh, that would be one of them that I would probably remember in my older days. The Bunker Hill uh, was the other ship that he remembered. It was a Connecticut privateer uh, schooner. Uh, she had 10 broadside cannons and five swivels, and she carried a smaller crew of 46 men. The ship was under the command of Sanford Thompson, along with Lieutenant John Smith and Lieutenant Samuel Stowe. Now, when Nathan put in his application for, uh, with the, to get, remember the ships he had, what he listed was that he was under Captain uh, Smith, is what he listed. So that's to his memory, it was Captain Smith. But when you look at the history of the ship, it said Sanford Thompson uh, was captain and, and Smith and uh, Stowe were lieutenants aboard the ship. This is what I believe happened with that one also. The Bunker Hill yeah, was in a battle with the British privateer sloop, the Dolphin, uh, which was en route to St. Kitts, British West Indies. <laughs> At this time, Lieutenant Stowe and Commander Thompson were wounded. Stowe was killed and Thompson wounded. Lieutenant Smith took over and captured the Dolphin. So I believe after this excursion that they named Smith as the captain. So sometime in between probably here and before the ship just disappeared off the records, I believe Nathan was aboard that ship. And I, I think that was a ship that was actually captured uh, by the British man of war and they sent the crew to Bermuda. Like I said, if I was gonna remember any two ships, it'd be the one I was captured on and then when I lost my brother. In. So that's just my speculation on the whole thing. But I think it's pretty good. So after that, after the war, uh, Nathan uh, migrated here uh, to North Carolina. Uh, he became really, really active in, in real estate, and commerce in the Deep River and Chatham County areas. Uh, in 1827, he was elected to the North Carolina House of Representatives or House of Commons. In 1832, he became a North Carolina senator. Um, and for a period of about 10 years before his death, he was a clerk of court of common pleas here in Chapel County. So when you start looking at Florida common plea records and stuff like that, Nathan's name is all over the place. So that's why I said that the history of that family is, is pretty uh, easily traced because also since he was in the Senate, there's records of that and all those good things. Uh, he was also uh, one of the commissioners chosen to lay out the plan for the town of Pittsburgh. Uh, the state government chose among the people that he was one of the ones that laid out the original plot lines for, for this area. Nathan also served as a clerk at the first school board in the area. So the thing about it is all the things that he did for the community if you think about those things, served as a senator, House of Commons, uh, clerk of court, uh, all those wonderful things that he did, and not to mention the rest of his family. His Winship was, a, was big into real estate. Winship actually owned at one time, if I'm uh, right in my speculation, you probably correct me on this or not. He actually owned the Yellow House at the time. So I, I was reading something on that on the president on who's on who owns that? Who's on the Ray, uh, good deal. Because uh, I've read one word for you, I uh, had put in there about finding some shoe buckles under the stairs. Yeah. They're, they're probably my shoes. They, they belong to me, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was before him because they were under plaster keys. Is that right? Yeah, so they were probably lost prior to them plastering the walls originally. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's just, uh, that's an interesting little fact. And that's, I believe the old house is. Probably the oldest still standing house in the county in this area, right? It was built in 1790. 79. Yeah. Anytime. Anyway, at some at some point that uh, cemetery was paved over with a parking lot and a concrete pad. I mean the concrete pad everybody calls it a dump pad. That's where they set the dump it was on the concrete pad. Uh here's here's a map of the well, last known uh cemetery location. Uh it was in the corner of that, that lot 73, I think, for Botman. We were able to follow the title chain back uh, with the help of the Historical Society uh, from 1784 all the way through to, to more around uh, 
1837. Uh, when she had owned that first lot, Pittsburgh, where he built his house, and in 1908, John Williams transferred lot 73 and 88 to Winship to satisfy a bond. Uh, the first grave in the cemetery uh, was dated 1790, which was Winship II. Uh, Winship died in 1828. Um, Margaret uh, Stedman uh, still owned the house and the, and the property, and they transferred that to Nancy Poe, which was her daughter. Uh, 1840, uh, Nathan A. Stedman and Orrin Stedman uh, were the executors, which was the daughter, the sons of Margaret Stedman. They, they used the name Nathan Stedman uh, throughout. You know, they, they were not creative in their names. So, so they named their son Nathan Stedman also. And they uh, transferred the lot 73 and 88 to the infant son of Daniel McLeod. They had a kind of a bond going on between uh, Daniel and some things. And, uh, however, the paperwork worked out, but they ended up transferring that to their, his infant son because he passed away. Uh, that was the last land transfer that mentioned the cemetery, excepting for a 25 foot square in the southwest corner of Lot 73, reserving a free and clear way of ingress and egress at any and all times. That's the way the, the, the uh, cemetery the way it was worded in the uh, documentation. Uh, the other land transfers mentioned the graveyard up to and including the transfer to Fred C. Justice in 1939. Fred Justice, he built the, the Chevrolet dealership or Ford, which I think he sold, I think he sold two or three brands at one time. Yeah. But he, he he bought the property in 1939, and it was after that that things kind of disappeared. Uh, so I don't know how that transpired, uh, but, but the, the graveyard got paved over. And uh, that uh, concrete pad is put where the cemetery had been. Any comments about that? You want to add anything to that? That's, there's more history to it, but uh, we talked about that. Yes, ma'am. That's the property. Yes, ma'am. With the church already there. No. Okay. That, that's why it's within the cemetery and not part of the Methodist Church. Not part of the Methodist Church. Yeah. yeah. I just couldn't it's like next door, the fence line of the church and, and Stedman Cemetery was on the other side of the fence line. But but at the time when that cemetery was started there, that the church building was the not there. No. I've got some points to make about that too that probably might just let me in. Yes, ma'am. You said they were there. I'm sure there were, <laughs> but, but when they did all this paving work, somebody, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, got rid of the headstones. So the only stone we found when we actually started doing some of the excavation, we did find a stone that, that kind of shaped like a, what it was, was a cornerstone. Because in, in the land plot, they said that the cemetery was marked by the cornerstones. So we found one stone that was out of place over there. And I'm sure it was probably one of the cornerstones of the cemetery. We never found any headstones. I wish I knew, but they, they're lost to time. But we started excavating the area uh, in March 9th of 2022. I remember it distinctly because it was rainy and cold. And they started, came, they came in with a, a street bucket to start with and kind of scraped off the top of the the soil and what they would do, they, we had uh, uh, our, uh, G, uh, what is it? archaeologists. Yeah. Archaeologist crew was there uh, and they were watching. And as soon as they hit a place where it looked like a grave shaft, they stopped digging. And then they did just like you can see in a TV movie or something. They just came out with a little bit of shovels and small stuff and were very meticulous about how they did things. Uh, so when they hit the first grave, that was that was pretty exciting. Uh, they found found the grave. Uh, they dug down a little bit and they found uh, coffin handles in that first grave and some nails. It was a child's grave. So as soon as I, I we found that, I, I called my cousin Paul, which lives in Texas, by the way, and and told him that we found uh, Emily's grave because I felt sure it was Emily's grave. She was only three months old when she died. She died what did I say, eighteen thirty six. She also had her two cousins, which were 
in their 30s probably died the same year. And, and I, I believe that year there was probably a, 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 some kind of epidemic going influenza, cholera. It was something that had got spread into the family a little bit. But when we found that first grade, that was, that was pretty exciting. There was a total of, of seven graves found. Uh, most of the, the graves in there, or most all of them, were hexagonal type coffins. They would dig a grave shaft straight down until they got to the place where they actually put the, the coffin in, and then they would change the way that the grave was dug to match the shape of the coffin. Some of them were actually dug in pretty far bedrock. And you guys know about Chatham County, uh, you know, they, they've only got one rock. It just goes everywhere. <laughs> but they had, they had to dig down uh, into the rock and put the, the coffins in there. I was so sure when we started this project that the only thing we would find would be dirt. Because you're talking about 200-year-old graves. Uh, but if we could find even a sign or something to be able to, to move whatever we found into the church and put a stone up to, to honor the family, I would be happy as I could be about it. Because uh, that's all I thought we'd find. But we not only found, you know, a couple of different kind of things, artifacts and stuff like that, but we found skeletal remains, which is really amazing for that time. Now, they were very fragile. Uh, that you know, If you mess with them much, they would, they would come apart on you. But, but we did find those things. There was often in there uh, uh, that I had a, a glass viewing the most coffins uh, did not have the glass viewing in there. Uh, the only one that had the handles was Emily's. Every other coffin didn't have any handles on it. But that one with the glass viewing in there, my speculation is that that was Nathan's son. Uh, Nathan's son had, uh, he had seizures. So it wouldn't surprise me that when they put him in the coffin that they wanted to make sure you know, that he was really gone. So they had that viewing in there for him. Uh, one one interesting thing about that particular one that had the viewing window in it, uh, there's there's a power line, an underground power line that goes from the street over here back to a three phase transform on the lower side of the cemetery. Uh, a lot of times, the way they put those power lines in is they bore them in. They don't dig a ditch always. They just take a board machine and go underground. So when they put that uh, power line in, they went right across the torso of that particular place. And the, the archaeologists were in there digging, and I was standing there watching like this. You know, I was there most every day they dug. But uh, he said, There's some pipes down here. And I, I looked down and I said, What color are they? He said, They're red. I said, That's power. So don't worry, as long as you don't break the pipe, you're fine. Only 13,000 volts, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they got a little nervous after that. You know, and I started telling them what that was about. But another interesting thing about that grave. And the only really artifact I say we found besides the glass and wood remains and nails and things like that was in the left uh, hand pocket, pants pocket probably of that, that particular person, uh, they found a coin. It was a, a half dime. And it was dated just a little bit, maybe a year or two before 1836, which was the year that they died. So that kind of dated it. And also, uh, the archaeologists were able to look at teeth and things like that, kind of give you a, a roundabout age of the person in, in, the, in the grave. Uh, the grave next to it, which I believe was Nathan III, I told you he was the oldest person in the graveyard. And, and they looked at him and looked at his teeth and said he's probably in his 80s. <laughs> to me, that kind of nails it down. So that was Nathan's grave. I feel pretty confident about that. We were really, really fortunate uh, to find that because when we started looking, there was there was always a little, you know, we're not sure. Uh, is it going to be here like we think it is? Or is it going to be, you know, 40 feet this way <laughs> on the sidewalk out here rather than the back parking lot? And there was days I was out here with the measure wheel, going up down the road and across. I said, well, I came up to the corner of that pad there. So we felt fairly confident, but we didn't know for sure if that would be the place, and, and God was looking out for us, and it, and it was uh, the site. So, but we re relocated the uh, the remains uh, that were there uh, to the uh, church next door, and and put up a monument for Nathan's family as well as Nathan for his Revolutionary War service. We had a commemorative uh, service for them. Uh, 
the SAR and the DAR was there, uh, along with one of our uh, senators that said the, the prayer end of it. Uh, there was contributions to the to the uh, uh, stones that we put out there, along with myself, uh, John Gunner, uh, which is a cousin, Larry Stedman O'Connell, uh, which helped with that, uh, Paul Smeal, as my cousin-in-law, and uh, Greg Stafford, which was the developer. Those are the people that helped pay for the stone. <laughs> now, Greg paid for the, for the dig, which there was no way that we could have afforded it as a family to have those graves moved. It was very, very expensive. And I mean, you know, if you guys know Greg, I don't know if you like him, love him, or whatever, but to me, he's a super guy. I told him he'll be a friend forever with what he's done to help us preserve history. Uh, when, when I first met him, he was really excited because they were digging up things from, from, you know, when the car dealership was there, little bottles, things like that. And he had a room, he had all that stuff lined up. It was just, just crazy about the his, history of the area. Uh, so this was this was an adventure for him as well as us. Uh, the one thing about it is, John, now John Gunner, uh, he's one of the people, once I found out that uh, there was a possibility that we found Nathan's grave, I called John. John was, has always been a, a big genealogist with the family. He's helped me years ago with some things. Uh, so I called John up. John called uh, Larry O'Connell, Dr. O'Connell. Dr. O'Connell, was, he's in his 80s now. But uh, he had been looking for uh, Nathan's grave for years. There, there was a controversy between over here and, and Asbury. Uh, they thought that, you know, Nathan may have been buried at Asbury. There's some people said, and they said, no, he's buried at the family cemetery here. Well, Dr. O'Connell, when he was a younger man, spent hours and hours and hours uh, going through the woods at Asbury, close to where the, Nathan's old house was at the time, uh, looking for the cemetery and never found it. So he was kind of my affirmation that uh, we were in the right place. Uh, and he, as soon as I called John, John gave me Larry's number, and before I could call him up, he was calling me, and I was telling him everything that had happened. He said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my father's grave and tell him he found me, and just things like, every time I say something like that, I kind of get a chill about it, because just that he put so much time into it, uh, and, and heartfelt love about the family, and we were able to find what he was looking for. You know, and him in his 80s now. Of course, he's a super guy. He's got the, I just talked to him the, the other day. But, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here with us. He had some other things. He's got a new girlfriend. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's doing well. But uh, one thing about John, though, John did come out uh, and, and with us when we were digging the graves up and getting ready to move them. And unfortunately, before we had our ceremony, the recognition ceremony, John had a heart attack and passed away. Uh, so he was not able to be there, <laughs> obviously, but his wife and, and son were there. And I was able to mention John and, and how much he meant to me. And, and you know, you never know uh, what's going to happen from time to time. I, I told you before, you know, that I'm, I feel like I'm a family historian and we study history and things like that. But the root word of historian in history is story. And we were able to share our stories, just like I'm sharing my story with you. You guys all got stories. I I get fascinated listening to this man. He's got a pot uh, full of them. And it's just all kinds of things about, about history and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's just a, a heartfelt thing with me and, and I'm sure with you, you too about your families. Here's a picture of Greg and uh, myself and, and Dr. O'Connell uh, that we took after the ceremony. Uh, also, uh, this is this is kind of a interesting thing too. I do have I do have a paper by the way that kind of covers all this that will be published with the historical society. So if you guys at some point want to go on their website, you'll probably be able to find this in the next couple of weeks or so whenever they decide to decide to publish it. But I, I wanted to give you just a little bit of irony on all this. You know, we lost Nathan's uh, grave uh, under the parking lot. Um, I also have some some Harringtons that are in my family line, and uh, there's a little book here. This is the letters of Kate Duckett Smith and John Harrington 
uh, was written between 1894 and 1907. Kate Duncan Smith is really big in uh, DAR, but they were writing letters back and forth when she was trying to prove her ancestry line to the to the Harringtons. And uh, and John wrote, wrote this back to her in one of his letters. Uh, he was the great grand or the grandson great grandson of Charles Harrington, which is my maybe sixth great grandfather. Uh, Charles actually fought in the, in the Battle of Alamance and died from his wounds there. Now, I'm not real sure which side of the fence he fought on at the time, but this is the thing about Alamance. There was a lot of people that fought, fought there and they were fighting for the government or for the, for the British crown. And later on after that battle, they switched sides. So all of Charles' sons fought uh, as patriots in, in the area. So whether he was a patriot or, or not, I don't know. But uh, John said this about it. He said, since writing my former letter, I learned that Charles Harrington, what, oh, it's wrong, wrong paragraph. Oh, here we go. Tradition says Charles Harrington was buried in Pittsburgh and, and lying out the town, the spot that contained his ashes was condemned, the headstone removed and the mound of earth leveled to the ground. There, all that is mortal of him sleeps, awaiting the resurrection morn. What lies buried there is little but what remains as much, the memory of a pioneer of American civilization and independence, the pro progenitor of a race of men, stout as granite, strong as steel, men who at least have always occupied the upper strata of the respectable middle class, men as a whole, not learned from intelligence, but wealthy, but, but independent, recognized with the, as a man with his great republic, should be the architect of his own fortune, and that the meager crumbs falling from the table of, of title and tradition are insufficient to keep the wolf in the door. So that's what's kind of ironic about the whole thing, because Nathan had a lot to do with laying out the town of Pittsburgh. He said, so Charles, in laying out the town of Pittsburgh, his grave was covered over. So Nathan's was covered over later by a parking lot. But uh, we were able to, like I said, recover the graves of Nathan Stedman and his family and they have a suitable burying place that you can all go visit over here at the church when you get time. That's all I've got. Is if there are more questions, you can on there. Yes, sir. So you, you said you found no no marker stones. No. Or no, and nothing nothing with, that was in any way, shape, form, fashion carved, right? No. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Did they have to dig further down than they thought they Yes. It was fairly deep. Yes, sir. it was fairly deep. Uh, that because I think you know soil was built up over the top over the years, uh, and and there's uh, so they dig dug down pretty pretty deep before they actually got to the grave shaft itself. Were they getting um, thinking they were in the wrong spot? No, they never thought that. They never thought that. They, just, they kept going Yes. Yeah, they're professional archaeologists. I, uh, they're they're all, actually all listed in that paper. If you get a chance to go on the website, look at that. Did they do any any ground penetration radar? They they attempted to do that, but because of the the upper strata was so disturbed anyway, uh, from from different things over the yeah. years. They moved back and forth. Yeah, they they, they weren't able to uh, prove anything with uh, GPR. They were the, there, there's a paper that the archaeologists wrote their report of that paper. Is on file downstairs, probably. Uh, it's on file here with the, the historical society. Yes, sir. So, you made a comment about the graves being dug as hexagons or octagons. What? But I didn't really follow that. Normally, but, it'd be like a like a rectangle, but they right. they would dig them down, knowing that it's hard dirt and everything else, and you're going to get shallow rock. Is was that a traditional thing? Or that was a traditional thing. Really? According to the archaeologists, that's, that was traditional. They go so far down, and then when they got to the place where they were actually going to set the coffin in, they would they would dig the hole in the shape of the coffin. Now, most of, you know our coffins now, like you say, are erected, but those had a side that went this way and this way. Oh, so they, yeah, they were, okay. and then the two, two at the top and the bottom, kind of like old Western days. You see those coffins. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, there, there was a statement of family file for this man. Your documentation for SAR, I believe, 
it took me nearly six years to really? collect all paper the East Coast and West Coast. Well, I, I guess I could say it took me that long too, because I had all this, most of the, the yeah. documentation. But it's documented, I, but man, what a... Then you, you know. got to track it down and prove it. I mean, exactly. I've got some friends that's, that are making an attempt to get my SAR now, and they're just so hard-nosed about, you got to have the proofs. So I was I was fortunate uh, to be able to gather all that in about a year's time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Before you leave, I think the museum will be reopening for a little bit of time. And if any of you are interested in becoming members of the uh, Chatham County Historical Association, we have a table set up down there, and the lady will be happy to give you the information that you need for that. Um, we try to have programs like this at least three times a year. Uh, we've, obviously, this will be the last one we have in this year. But there are several other activities that we are involved in, and the gentleman sitting here actually owns the, the Yellow House that was mentioned earlier and has restored it. And he was part of this uh, first Sunday tour today, and every time they do that, he invites people into his home and you're welcome to do that. Speak with him if you'd like to. But I, I, again, I appreciate all of you coming and I uh, hope to see you back again when we do this in the future. Very good.